In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The theme for this morning, Christ enters Jerusalem to offer his life for the salvation of the world. Now when you read this statement, it indicates that Jesus went with a purpose to Jerusalem. Jesus had an intention and that intention was go to Jerusalem to offer your life as the salvation of the world. So the intent of Jesus is what we see very strong in this theme that there is a deliberate movement on the part of Jesus now to go to Jerusalem knowing that the cross loomed above him and that he would be crucified and that he would rise again from the grave. Intention. This is that strong word. Now when you look at the dictionary meaning of intention in our day-to-day -day popular understanding of the term, intention is something that you want and plan to do. You desire something to be done and you plan to do it. Or intention could be said to be an aim or a goal which you want to accomplish in life. A goal to be accomplished in life. Enter Jerusalem to offer my life as a means of salvation for the world. So that is what this word intention focuses on. Something you want to happen and you plan for it and you give yourself to it. Now when you look at intentions in life, we have two kinds of intentions. When one is general category of intentions, I want to lead by example. That's a general kind of intention. I want to love unconditionally. That's a general intention. I want to be kind to people. General intention. I intend to manifest happiness naturally. That's a general intention. But we can have specific, particular intentions. For example, some of you may say, this coming Good Friday, I will spend the day in prayer and fasting. A very specific intention. I will spend this coming Good Friday, 2nd April, in prayer and fasting. Or you may make another intention. I will join the church choir and faithfully go for choir practices every Saturday or whenever the practices are called for. So this is a specific intention. Or every day I will perform one act of charity. Every day I will perform one act of charity. A specific intention. In the Roman Catholic Church, of course, intention becomes some, somewhat more specific as a kind of a special aim or purpose for which a mass is celebrated. A mass means a service with the Holy Eucharist. Uh, there is a special intention in your mind and for which you celebrate the Holy Eucharist service. Or to put it in simpler terms, you have a special intention and you come to church and prayers are specifically offered 
for that intention. So those are specific intentions. But having talked about intentions, we also need to note that general and specific intentions, whatever they be, they rise from the core of your life. Intention should come from within you. And those intentions we have to be examining. Proverbs chapter 16, Proverbs 16 verse 2, it says, All the ways of a man are pure in his eyes, but the Lord examines the motives. Of course, in most of our Bible it is said, the Lord weighs the spirit. So the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. He has got intentions. But then the Lord weighs the spirit behind the intentions. The Lord weighs the motives behind your intentions. And this proverb is repeated again in 21 verse 2. Proverbs 21 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. That's the only difference. The heart is mentioned here. So whether it's Lord weighing the spirit, Lord weighing the heart, the important point is God is examining your motives. You've got intentions. But what are the motives behind those intentions? We know so many campaigns are made and so many promises are made. If we are elected, we will do this. We intend to do this. We will do that. But what are the motives behind all those election promises that are made? God weighs the heart, looks at the motives. Even for us as Christians, James says in James chapter 4 verse 3, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. You ask with wrong intentions that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So sometimes we are making prayers, prayers to God with which intention? The motive behind that intention is to gratify yourself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 3, Paul says, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. If I deliver my body to be crucified, but have not love, it is nothing. So, intention should have a proper motive. Motive that is acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Dan Burke has written a book entitled Navigating the Interior Life. Navigating the Interior Life. There's a subtitle to that book. It says Spiritual Direction and the Journey to God. And what does he say? Intention is an act of the will tending effectively to do good. Intention is an act of the will tending effectively to do some good proposed by the mind as desirable and attainable. But then he goes on to say, intention differs from simply willing. Willing 
is the desire for an end without concern about the means. Intention is desiring not only some good but also the means of obtaining this good. So this is another deeper dimension about intention. Intention should have a proper motive and intention as it is sought to be executed has to have righteous means. So motive and means. These are important in intention. Jesus had that motive, the salvation of the world and the means was the cross suffering. It's interesting that in criminal law they use the word intent and intent is defined as a subjective state of mind that must accompany the acts of certain crimes to constitute a violation. Now here of course when court cases are argued there can be a lot of hair splitting saying that the man committed the crime but he had no intention. But remember the word says intent is a subjective state of mind that must accompany the act. State of mind that must accompany the act. And as Christians when we look at the model of Jesus an intention to go to Jerusalem to give his life for the salvation of men. So there's that intention, the motive and the means. What about our intentions? Micah chapter 2 verse 1. This is God's judgment on people. Woe to those who devise wickedness who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it because it is in the power of their hands. So see, it's a vivid example of a person lying in bed in the night and making plans. How can I win this election? How can I make more money? How can I become more popular and then he, he devises or she devises plans and the next morning when the person wakes up he goes about to execute those plans. A similar thought you find in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children declares the Lord who execute a plan but not mine and make an alliance but not of my spirit in order to add sin to sin. So here again the word of God is critical on people with evil intentions and the way they plan to execute them and they may be religious they are my children God says they are my children but they are executing a plan which is not mine and they have an alliance which is not of my spirit. Hosea chapter 7 verse 6 this is a stronger image for like an oven their hearts burn with intrigue all night their anger smolders in the morning, it blazes like a flaming fire. Evil intentions can be very disastrous. And it is in that line, Psalm 38 verse 12 becomes significant for us as we look at the passion of Christ. Psalm 38 verse 12, those who seek my life lay snares for me and those who seek to injure me 
have threatened destruction and they devise treachery all day long. Now the, this is a psalm and according to some scholars who, who look at Jesus on the cross, they say Jesus was remembering all the psalms and even this psalm comes within that list of psalms that Jesus was remembering on the cross. Those who seek my life lay snares for me, evil intentions, and those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction. They devise treachery all day long. Intentions. But when we are looking at the intention of Jesus, it is something deeper, which we, as we tried to say earlier, what is intention? Something that you desire uh, to execute, something that you plan, an objective. But now, the deeper dimension of good intention is transforming the evil planned for you into something good transforming the evil which others have planned for you into a blessing. One good example you have is in the book of Genesis. There is the story of Joseph and how his brothers were envious of him and they got rid of him. They sold him into slavery in Egypt. But then what happens? This Joseph whom they had got rid of by God's grace rises in the esteem of the powers of Egypt and becomes the food minister of Egypt during the times of drought and famine. And the brothers who had been responsible for selling him to slavery, they had to come to Egypt to get their food grain. And eventually, of course, Joseph reveals himself to them. I am that brother whom you sold into slavery. And then in Genesis chapter 50, verse, the, the last few verses, the brothers come to Joseph and they beg pardon. They say, please forgive us for all the evil that we did to you in the past. What does Joseph say? Genesis 50 verse 20. Joseph speaking to his brother says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So, his brothers planned evil. But the very evil intention which they executed was transformed by God into a blessing that Joseph becomes the food minister in Egypt and through his wise administration, the seven years of drought were years in which food was available to the people and so the lives of the people were saved. So, in God's hands, intended evil becomes eventual good. Intended evil becomes eventual good. And this is what should encourage us in times when you and I go through difficulties. If we are truly committed to the Lord and you face difficulties, Romans 8.28 we know that in everything, God works for good with those who love him. In everything, God works for good for those who love him. And so, even hostility, even conflict, even oppression is converted into a blessing. It is in this context that we look at the theme, Jesus enters Jerusalem to offer his life for the salvation of the whole world. Now in the gospel according to Matthew, 
you get a sense that Jesus realized that his was the call to proclaim the kingdom of God in the midst of a kingdom of evil and wickedness. And if he was going to proclaim the kingdom of God, there would be oppression and that he would, he would be killed. He was well aware of that much before the incident happened in Jerusalem. The first indication you get is in Matthew chapter 16 verse 21. Matthew 16 verse 21, you know the story in Matthew 16, the first uh, verses. Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say I am? And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the, the Messiah. Hmm? Then Matthew 16 21, it is written, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So from that time, from that time, that is in Matthew 16, at a place called Caesarea Philippi, where the disciples said to Jesus, you are the Messiah. But they were looking for a great king who would rule from the throne of Jerusalem. But Jesus said, I am no such king. I have got hostility and people will kill me. When I go to Jerusalem, I will be killed and rise again on the third day. From that time, now this is a very significant phrase. This phrase is used second time here. The first time it is used, you notice it is in Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. Matthew 4 verse 17, it is said, From that time Jesus began to preach. And what did he preach? He preached that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. So, he had undergone baptism. He had heard the voice of God, you are my beloved son with whom I am pleased. And then he was to go into the wilderness. But from that call of God, you are my beloved son, that assurance, from that time, Jesus focused on this word, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And now, the second time in 1621, from that time, Jesus says, I'm committed to the kingdom, but the kingdom will bring in opposition and I will be killed. Matthew 17, verses 22 to 23. In Matthew 17, we have the story of the transfiguration of Jesus. You see Jesus there being transfigured and with Moses and Elijah there. And there's a blessed experience. And then after that, Jesus comes down with his disciples and he heals an epileptic. And after he heals that epileptic, there were people gathering in Galilee. Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. So again, much before the time was to come, Jesus says this, I am going to go to Jerusalem and I will be killed and rise again on the third day. Then it goes on, Matthew 20 verses 17 to 19. As Jesus was preparing to go to Jerusalem, he had not yet entered Jerusalem, preparing to go to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and crucified and he will be raised on the third day. So now you see the, the theme for today is telling us that Jesus was intent. 
He knew that his life would lead him to the cross and he would rise again. But in all the three quotations, there is no mention of salvation. He is just saying, I will be killed and on the third day I will be raised again. So where does this imagery of dying for the salvation come? This imagery comes in the gospel according to John. In the gospel according to John, you notice again, just like when uh, 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 the phrase that we had from that time, that was in Matthew from that time. But in John's gospel, there is another phrase, the coming of the hour, the coming of the hour. In the second chapter of John, when Jesus performs that miracle of turning water into wine, he tells his mother, my hour has not come. And you find that there was another time when the crowds wanted to crown him king. Jesus escapes. He says, my hour has not come. So my hour has not come. My time has not come. So Jesus is seeing that there is a purpose in his life and it has to be fulfilled. And then when you come to John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24, there are some people who want to see Jesus. And Jesus is told that some people have come to see you. Then in John 12, verses 23, 24, Jesus says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now look at that phrase. To be glorified. The hour has come to be glorified. And then how does he explain this glorification in that same passage? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So, glorification is connected with death. Just like a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies and then it germinates and a plant grows up and then it bears much more food grains. What is this hour of glorification? One clue is that it is a dying and resurrecting just like the seed germinates. So a dying and a resurrecting. What is this hour of glorification? You go back to John chapter 3 verse 14. And there it is written, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So right there, in the discussion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, this verse comes in. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, he lifted up that serpent on a pole. And all those who had disobeyed God, if they looked up to the serpent on that pole, their sickness would be removed. That is why our medical professional people have that sign of the cross with the serpent, the sign of healing. And so here it is said, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So the death on the cross would become the salvation of all creation. And then in John chapter 17, Jesus says that prayer Oh, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son. So, friends, there's an intention. An intention which changes the evil forces into a blessing for all creation. Jesus enters Jerusalem to give his life for the salvation of all creation.